missiles that carry destruction, ammunition that is incredibly dangerous but still used. If nuclear weapons come to mind, then you have the right idea. Damage from exposure to hydrogen and atomic bombs is measured in millions of dollars, but no one really goes into details about why this happens. It seems to me that this is a very interesting topic for analysis. Therefore, today I'll tell you what's the secret of the destructiveness of these bombs, and indeed, how they work. Some people think that atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs are virtually the same. To some extent, this is true because both types of bombs are categorized as nuclear weapons. But to talk about the differences, first we need to understand the basic concept. Nuclear arms are weapons of mass destruction that use nuclear energy to create an explosion. This energy, in turn, is contained in atomic nuclei and is released during nuclear reactions and radioactive decay. I'm sure that the last two concepts are already familiar to you. I've mentioned similar processes occurring in the nuclei of stars several times before. But today, we move away from the topic of space and discuss what's created by human hands. So, if both types of bombs use nuclear energy, what could be the difference? The main thing is in how they explode. Let's start with an analysis of the atomic bomb. This weapon usually looks like an elongated, rounded torpedo. Nothing special, but the main danger lies inside. To get the so-called nuclear explosion, a certain reaction must occur – the chain reaction of the fission of heavy nuclei. There are several heavy elements that are capable of such a reaction. Usually, uranium-235 is used in nuclear weapons. You might have heard somewhere that not only uranium-235 is radioactive, there's also uranium-238 as well as uranium-234. Different numbers tagged to the end of an element are isotopes. To put it simply, different types of one element. But we won't go into unnecessary details, because only uranium-235 can do what we are all here for. To obtain the maximum amount of energy during the explosion of an atomic bomb, the content of 235 isotope in uranium should be at least 80%. Therefore, in the production of nuclear weapons, uranium is enriched further. But if something goes wrong with this process, there is a fallback. You can also create a plutonium bomb, which will be based on the isotope with the number 239. However, this element is rarely found in nature, which means that you'd have to try and create it artificially. Now we know enough about the inside of an atomic bomb. But how do we launch such a weapon? The nuclear explosion occurs because a certain mass of fissile material is concentrated in one place. This can also be called critical mass. When it is reached, a nuclear decay reaction is formed with the release of energy. But for a powerful explosion, one critical mass is not enough. To get a truly destructive bomb, you'll need four to five critical masses of matter. There are several ways to achieve this, but I'll talk about the main one. It's called implosive. Imagine a nuclear bomb, for example, in the form of a small ball. Inside it are all the necessary components for a nuclear reaction, but the critical mass hasn't been reached. In order to achieve this, we'll create a guided explosion from the outside. Suppose I put an explosive on the outside of the bomb and detonate it. When properly exposed, the space inside the bomb will begin to shrink towards the center of the shockwave. The density of uranium or plutonium inside will increase and we get a nuclear explosion. What about the hydrogen bomb? In this explosive device, energy is released due to thermonuclear fusion. A very fast explosive reaction takes place inside the charge with the help of elements such as deuterium and tritium. Other heavier elements can also be used along with them. However, the main effective substance is lithium hydride. 
by itself, it doesn't produce an explosion. So clearly, we need something else. The detonation of this substance is usually carried out by an integrated nuclear device with low power. In a simple way, it can be called a detonator. When it's activated, energy is released, which triggers an explosive thermonuclear reaction inside the bomb. Interestingly, for hydrogen bombs, there's theoretically no limit to the power. If you wish, you could create such a powerful bomb that it would simply wipe all life from the face of the Earth. But I hope it never crosses anyone's mind. By the way, more about power. In the case of nuclear weapons, they're measured in TNT equivalent. Why is that so? TNT is an explosive and quite well known. To understand the power of a nuclear explosion, a certain amount of TNT is needed to produce the same energy. Usually it's expressed in kilotons and megatons, and I have some examples of various bombs. To begin with, the famous Tsar Bomba. It's related to thermonuclear, that is, a hydrogen type of weapon. Its power is 58.6 megatons. Simply put, it was such an amount of TNT that would have had to have been detonated in order to compare with this one bomb. As for nuclear weapons, the most famous are Little Boy and Fat Man. The first was dropped on the city of Hiroshima in 1945 and had a capacity of 13 to 18 kilotons of TNT. The second bomb destroyed the city of Nagasaki three days after the first. It had a capacity of 21 kilotons. The consequences of strikes with such power are not difficult to predict. First of all, there's chaos and destruction caused by a shockwave and light radiation. But there's also something that cannot be seen with the eyes. It's impossible to feel or hear. I'm talking about radiation. Radiation, one of the factors caused as a result of the explosion of nuclear weapons. And if you're near a detonated bomb, I have bad news for you. There are three main types of ionizing radiation. These are alpha, beta, and gamma. And no matter how much we wouldn't want it, they would all contaminate the area where a nuclear explosion occurred. Alpha radiation will not do much harm. A person's clothing may well protect them from contact with exposed skin. But it's also worth protecting your mucous membranes. Beta radiation is a little more serious and can cause significant damage at a distance of several tens of meters or feet from the radiation source. Among the consequences could be radiation burns and cataracts. It's unlikely that anything will protect us from the effects of gamma radiation, except for thick layers of certain substances such as lead and concrete. With its high penetrating power, it literally permeates the body, causing damage. The most well-known consequences are radiation sickness, cancer, and gene mutations. At the moment, nine countries have nuclear weapons, and they're also deployed to foreign installations. But even if someone wanted to, the total power of the entire world nuclear arsenal wouldn't be able to destroy the whole planet. There are about 15,000 nuclear warheads in the world. All of them have different amounts of power. But let's take some approximate values. For example, suppose each of the 15,000 bombs have a capacity of 500 kilotons. Putting them all together, we get a super bomb with a capacity of 7,500 megatons. What would it be capable of? Well, to give an example, it would be an explosion with a force about 13,000 times less than an impact from the asteroid Chicxulub. You already know the consequences of its fall, so reduce them also by about 13,000 times. In any case, nuclear weapons can't be compared with any other weapon. It's not allowed to be used just because somebody wants to. Therefore, we shouldn't fear a nuclear strike in the near future. But it's important to understand how such a weapon works. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up if you like this video. Click on the bell so you don't miss new releases. 
and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on the latest developments from the world of science.